All right, today my presentation is on weed control in vegetables, principles and practices, um, and we'll go over some organic options. And that's my email, uh, anything, anything you need, uh, email me and I'm happy to help. All right, uh, uh, believe it or not, this picture was taken uh, over a weekend. Uh, in three days, uh, you, you were able to, you, you're supposed to be able to see the new planted uh, beans and then uh, uh, we had rain and then over a weekend, four days later, five days later, the uh, the young uh, weeds that were about an inch tall uh, got to be that big. Uh, and so in, in Texas, in our warm climate, and uh, you have weeds uh, germinating year round. Uh, and it can be a serious issue. It is a serious issue, especially for commercial producers. In general, commercial producers uh, spend uh, the least amount of money on herbicides if, if you figure out their total expenses between fungicide, insecticide, herbicides, labor, they spend the least amount on weed control. Uh, but if they fail at proper weed control, the damage is the most significant. I mean, you can lose 90% of your crop or more, like you see in this picture, uh, uh, due to weed management, uh, more than you would lose from insects or diseases. The goal, when we talk about weed control, always think about, uh, I am not trying to control the weed that I see now. I'm trying to control the, the number of seed in the soil, or what we call weed seed bank. Yeah, so it's a really a long-term goal rather than just, uh, I see the weed, I kill it, I'm done. Um, and the approaches, uh, you, uh, it's pre uh, uh, three approaches, prevention, eradication, and control. Uh, we don't care about eradication. I don't want you to worry too much about eradication, and I'll tell you more in detail what they mean. Uh, I don't think you need to worry about that because you will always have... Um, it's too expensive. If you're a commercial grower, um, having zero weeds 100% of the time, it's not economically feasible. It's not worth that extra money. Uh, there are certain times, and we'll go over that. Uh, so in detail, the prevention means you want to stop the weed from coming into the field, logically. That's what prevention means. And the Sources of uh, weed introduction, uh, for uh, logic, uh, you know, you can understand that birds and animals with their droppings uh, do that. Uh, you buy seeds and uh, can, uh, weed seeds come in with the crop that you purchased. Transplant, sometimes there's a, uh, in the pot, there's a, um, a weed in there. Uh, irrigation water, if you're using well or flood water or from a creek or from a pond or from a river, uh, things like that. And farm machinery, uh, whether on a large scale like a tractor, wheat seeds stuck on the tire and going from one place to another or from on your hole or on your hand hole or on your shoes or things like that. Of course, people is something, a factor we don't think about, uh, and I apologize for this picture, but what you see there is my shoes and socks one time after coming from uh, the field, the top two, and look how many grass seeds uh, are stuck on my sock and inside my shoe. Uh, anywhere you go with that, you're dropping seeds uh, everywhere you're going. Uh, my hand in the middle picture and all these black dots that you see are from common purslane. I was weeding uh, common purslane, uh, and each uh, uh, seed uh, has a potential to grow a plant. And each plant with common purslane uh, can give you another uh, 10,000 to 500,000 seeds. So you can imagine, uh, you can understand when I say your goal is not controlling the weeds now, but reducing the weed seed banks in the soil. Right here in this hand is probably, what, 20, 30 seeds. That's 20, 30 plants uh, times, on average, even only 10,000 seeds. You can imagine that you'll be weeding for the rest of your life. 
So eradication, like uh, the definition of eradication, is the complete elimination of all weed, plant parts, seeds, everything from the seed field. That is too expensive, that it's uh, a unattainable goal, it's not worth the money, it's not worth the effort. Uh, or in a in a raised bed uh, in a you know in the backyard that's doable uh, for aesthetic purposes but if you uh, when it becomes on a large scale it's not worth it there are good times to have wheat free and there are times when you can we can ignore the weeds uh, and we'll go over those uh, uh, specific times in more detail control. Uh, the definition of the third approach uh, is the process of limiting the economical impact of weeds. So uh, you are not controlling the weed, you're, you're controlling uh, how much it will affect your crop. For example, uh, a weed uh, early in the season, one weed can reduce your tomato yield by 10%. And uh, some researchers did that with pigweed, and they found that one weed seed uh, early in the season reduced your yield by uh, 10% early, if it's early in the season. But later in the season, when the plant is starting to uh, produce, if weeds germinate, they found no uh, effect of that uh, weed or multiple weeds uh, on the on the final yield. So so then uh, you start thinking, okay, economically speaking, uh, I'm not worried about the presence of the weed. I'm more worried on the economical impact of the weeds. So here are, uh, we talk about the approaches. Let's talk about the major methods of weed control. How do we control weeds. Uh, we all think of hoeing, which is still number one option and the best one so far for organic uh, gardeners and producers. Uh, and that fall into the mechanical uh, method. Uh, other uh, methods for weed control include cultural, biological, and uh, chemical. And I will tell you a little bit uh, more, give you examples for each. Um, you will be successful, you will do a great job if you uh, approach weed control as a systems approach. Can we combine two, three, or all of them rather than rely on one, uh, rather than only rely on weeding or only rely on spraying herbicides or using a mulch, or etc. Combining is uh, a uh, additive effect, you get more benefit from combining uh, more than one approach. And that's what we call a systems approach to weed control. Okay, examples of mechanical control is cultivation. And I listed them here in terms of, uh, to me, at least to me, of how effective they are or, and how uh, much uh, they are practiced by commercial or small acreage producers. So uh, the top one, uh, cultivation, is the one most uh, used and practiced. And an example is like I told you, hoeing, whether by manual hoeing or tractor equipment that does uh, mechanical cult cultivation. Um, mulching, solarization, flooding, uh, flaming, and then mowing. Uh, and uh, I'll talk more about solarization. I think you can recognize the rest. I'll tell you more what I mean by solarization. Uh, flaming, again, just like it says, uh, there are equipment that you can use a flame, whether it's a backpack uh, or on a large scale behind a tractor that can scorch the weeds and kill them, uh, uh, scar them and scorch them and kill them when they are very young. Uh, before they develop. If you miss the, that stage and they are big, then uh, flooding, uh, I'm sorry, flaming will, will not be very effective. So timing for weed control, and I'm going to say timing many times, many times in this presentation, is very important. Getting the weed at the right time is more important than having 100% uh, weeds removed. Um, and here it is, timing, showing up the first time. So uh, since uh, cultivation is the one most uh, practiced and most beneficial, 
uh, having the right tools, uh, uh, well prepared. Uh, for example, how many of you, your hoe is uh, sharp, uh, is sharp, not just dull. I mean, and, and clean. Uh, remember the weed seeds transfer uh, with your equipment. If your hoe is not sharp, I mean, I'm not saying razor sharp, but sharp that if you put it on the surface and you and you push back and forth, uh, you are shaving the weeds, uh, seedlings, and you can weed all day without breaking a sweat or uh, getting blisters. If you have to use the hoe uh, to dig up weeds, uh, you miss that timing. That weed, uh, you, you should have done it uh, three weeks earlier or two weeks earlier. Uh, so, and that's what I mean by timing. Um, um, you, when you when you put that hoe and you shave, move it back and forth, and you shave like the top half inch of that soil surface, you are root pruning the weeds, and, and that's how you get rid of them. If you have to dig, hammer it in the soil to dig up a big weed, uh, you, you miss the boat. Uh, the damage is done. That weed is big. It's tall water. It's tall nutrients from the soil uh, and uh, probably affected your yield also. So that's what I mean by proper equipment adjustment and, and depth. So since I mentioned timing uh, and how important it is, remember this number, 40 days. There's a lot of research has been done and determined uh, that the critical period for weed control is the first 40 days uh, for, from seeding or transplanting. In other words, you seed today, uh, the next 40 days, you want to have 100% wheat free for those 40 days. Uh, weeds that emerge later, if you're uh, commercial and you're busy with spraying, you're busy with harvest, you're busy with sales, uh, weeds that germinate after the first 40 days, you can ignore them. They are not affecting your yield. I have seen many organic farms early in the season. They look pristine. They look picture perfect. You go towards the end of the season, it looks like a jungle with the weeds. They don't care and the yields are not affected. They're busy selling, making money. Uh, they are not uh, busy uh, worrying about it looks pretty. But they know that the first 40 days is critical and they manage to keep it weed free the first 40 days. Of course, like I said, in a backyard homeowner situation, small area, uh, you can afford the time to keep it weed free longer and, and why not do that? It looks a lot prettier. Uh, one uh, way of uh, uh, controlling weeds uh, and take timing, use timing to your advantage is what we call stale bed culture. You can uh, you can cover um, cover your garden w w like this time of year uh, with a black plastic for two or three weeks. The weeds will germinate because the soil is warm, but they're not getting any sun and they will die. Uh, and uh, when you remove that plastic, if you don't uh, dig up that soil and turn it over, that top surface uh, is weed free uh, from the annual weeds. You can plant in it and you have much, much reduced number of weeds that will bother you the rest of the season. That's what we call stale bed culture. Uh, of course, for commercial growers, uh, they use herbicides to uh, spray herbicides after the weeds in, uh, emerge and they don't disturb the soil anymore because you don't want to disturb the soil like rototill it or, uh, or mix it up so that you don't bring seeds from the bottom up to the surface so they can germinate again. And that's what we call it. It's a, it's a great tool for uh, a homeowner. Uh, of course, you don't want to. You don't have to use uh, Roundup. Uh, just yesterday in Beaumont, I saw a grower that had a large area covered with black plastic, and uh, and that he was using this approach. They will germinate under that plastic. Uh, they are not they won't get any light. They will die. And he, he removes the plastic before planting, and uh, and without uh, too much disturbance. Um, it will be weed, uh, l less weed free. There will always be weeds because there will be perennial weeds that will not be completely killed by that approach, but at least uh, will get rid of the majority 
of the annual week that uh, and save himself time, herself time from hoeing and uh, cultivation afterwards. Plastic mulch is uh, uh, is uh, the, an example of uh, the cultural approaches. Um, the, you have uh, plastic mulch is approved for organic uh, certified production. Um, and nowadays, uh, the, you can buy a roll, for example, that's 200 foot long. That wasn't available in, uh, until recently. Uh, so homeowners who are willing to buy a short, small roll, and they are four foot wide, so they're perfect for a backyard raised bed. Of course, it's 200 foot long, so it will last you for a long time, or you can share it with your neighbors and our fellow master gardeners. But uh, any uh, mulch uh, is, uh, is a great tool if you know how to use it. If you want to use mulch, regular mulch, uh, you need to put four or six inch thick layer. One or two inch layer is just decoration. Weeds will, will grow uh, through that. Uh, uh, cardboard is a lot better because nothing will grow through that. Not nut sedge, not uh, 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 crab grass. Uh, Bermuda grass, nothing. It, it is thick. Of course, of course, it's ugly. Uh, and well, then if you like, you can use cardboard and cover it with uh, with a thin layer of mulch for decoration, or even a thin layer of compost on top of it for decoration. It will rot. It will give you good benefit for about three, four months. It will rot, and by next year, you can mix it in the soil. It looks like adding uh, compost. But look at this slide here. This is from a commercial watermelon operation. You can imagine that if uh, uh, this plastic mulch was not used, the whole field uh, would have had this uh, carpet weed everywhere. Now uh, it's only at the edge of that plastic, which they could not uh, cultivate mechanically, uh, like you see, uh, we're in a clean area. Uh, OK, and here's uh, other options of our uh, mulch. Um, on the upper right is uh, rice hulls in the Beaumont area. Um, they have a lot of rice production. It's a waste. They're happy if you take it and use it anyway um, for free. Straw, wood chips, pine needles, anything will work. Remember, you need a very thick area or plastic mulch like you see on the bottom left. And here's the picture, like uh, using cardboard. This uh, I, a small uh, demonstration I did behind the building in College Station. This raised bed was for, covered with weeds uh, and Virginia creepers and perennials, uh, really ugly, terrible, terrible. So you see at the very edge, uh, the cardboard exposed. We covered that whole raised bed. It was eight to eight foot wide. Covered it with cardboard and put a thin layer of mulch over it just for decoration. And nothing grew, uh, grew out of it. And the bottom right picture, you'll see uh, when I lifted the cardboard, you'll see the uh, Virginia creeper and all the uh, weeds uh, trying to grow towards the light. Um, trying to make through, but none of the weeds grew uh, through it. Uh, it worked perfectly. We went from a jungle, looked like a neglected garden, never been used, uh, maintained in the last 20 years, to a beautiful garden, and we had uh, broccoli, and we had a beautiful garden. The, um, if you are a, a small scale operations uh, operation, and you're willing to invest money, like about I don't know, $5,000, you can buy a BCS tractor, like you see in the picture here, which uh, can have lots of implements attached to it, like a rototiller. Uh, and one of the implements is a plastic layer for uh, uh, small areas, uh, for a small uh, acreage producer, like inside a tunnel, as you see here. So it, um, it can be... Um, there are equipment even for small scale. And remember, I work with those small growers, so this presentation is useful for them. Um, uh, and uh, for a, about $1,000, you can get that attachment uh, and lay plastic uh, on, a, uh, on that uh, uh, BCS uh, tractor uh, tiller. 
uh, great way to uh, lay plastic uh, uh, in a confined space that you cannot use a tractor in it. All right, I mentioned solarization. Let me go over it in detail. This here you see is solarization done on a commercial scale in California. Uh, and of course, uh, I do it on a homeowner scale. What do you need to have? You need clear plastic, not black, not blue, not white, clear plastic. If you use black plastic, you're warming up the soil. You're not solarizing, you're not sterilizing. Clear plastic with a lot of water. So if you have a raised bed, flood it, add a ton of water, cover it with plastic, tuck the edges in. You are trapping the steam inside it. And I did a measurement and on Aggie Horticulture, I have an extension publication on solarization, uh, uh, the study that I did. And I had uh, temperatures 180, 185 every day during the day. Uh, I mean, that killed all the wheat seeds, killed diseases, killed insect eggs. On this um, scale, um, of course, it's too expensive to remove that plastic and lay down black plastic to plant in. So what they do is they spray it with white uh, wash, like a lime mixture, uh, and the white, uh, and then a couple of weeks later, when the soil temperature cools down, they plant in it. Um, and this picture is uh, on a raised bed. Of course, this is clear plastic. It may look white here or silvery color. That's the angle of the picture, uh, but you need to use clear plastic. Okay, uh, and you know, a lot of water. Uh, uh, tuck the edges in to, to trap that steam. And you can do it anytime. It's not the temperature that's important. It's the number of sunny days. Even in the winter, if you have uh, lots of sunny days, keep it. But in the summer, um, four weeks is more than enough to sterilize that soil. So since our tomatoes end in July, they start uh, really setting. They can, the plant can continue to grow, but the fruit will abort in July. I think in Texas, we're blessed with that window of opportunity that I call between our, the end of our spring planting and the beginning of our fall planting. So July, for example, sometimes in July, early uh, July, August, those four weeks in that period between the end of your spring garden and planning for your fall garden, you solarize for four weeks, you will not have weeds uh, for a year uh, or, or longer. Of course, I don't recommend you do it every year in the same spot. If you have multiple raised beds, one year you do one raised bed, and the other year you do the other, the other, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I said you kill all the weeds, insect eggs. You will also kill all the beneficial microorganisms in the soil. But if you add compost uh, before planting, you are putting back all the good uh, microorganisms uh, that you uh, that you have may have killed with solarization. So since we always add compost, and I always recommend adding compost uh, before every planting. With solarization, adding compost is uh, a requirement, not a not an option really. It's a requirement to to put back the microorganisms that you may have killed with solarization. So let me show you a little study I did in 2012. Uh, the picture on the left is a 10 by 10 uh, square foot area. Um, and this picture was taken 83 days after the plastic was removed. So they were solarized for four weeks. I took the plastic off and then 83 days later, the picture on the left is the bed that was solarized. You see only a few weeds uh, made it, especially towards the edge of the plastic, which probably because, you know, not enough heat was trapped there. And the 10 by 10 on the right side, similar area, that was not solarized. You see the horse nettle, all plantain, all kind of weeds. The same beds, uh, 210 days later, so the following March, 
the bed that was solarized, it did have weeds, but all the weeds that you see here are perennial weeds, so deep-rooted that came from deep roots from uh, and uh, made it to the surface. Uh, and like I said, solarization may not get uh, perennial, all the perennial weeds. But if I count them, all this is one, there's one, two, three, maybe there's 10, 20 weeds total. It's easy to clean up compared to the, on the right, the non-solarized bed, there's probably, I don't know, 500, 1,000 weeds, all the grasses, everything that uh, grew over the winter. And when I look at this picture, I'm not worried about the weeds that I see. I'm worried about the, the seeds on each one of them because each one of these 500 or 1,000 plants has probably another 500 seeds that I, it, it's putting back in the soil. Remember the wheat seed bank, not just the weeds that you see that should bother you, concern you. It's the wheat seed that they're putting back in the soil. So solarization does work, but please remember clear plastic, a lot of water, tuck the edges in four weeks in July, August, between your fall and your spring, spring and fall garden, uh, and add compost before planting, and uh, you will you will have a great garden, uh, less headache in terms of weed control. Cultural methods, we switch now to cultural methods, uh, smother crops, competitive crops, crop rotation, et cetera, et cetera. And now let me show you some pictures and examples. Smother crops, um, I don't know how many of you uh, um, grow a cover crop um, over the winter when things are like your raised bed. If you're a good gardener, you should never have a soil that's just laying idle, doing nothing. If you want to plant a fall garden, you throw in some uh, cereal rye, some wheat, some oats, let it germinate, um, uh, mow it, uh, use a weed eater to mow it. You're putting back the grass clippings on the soil surface. It's acting like a weed mulch and it's putting back the nitrogen in the soil, what we call green manure. But at the same time, that thick, dense cover of uh, the crop, cover crop that you seeded will smother, will shade, will outshade lots of other weeds and, and kill them. And that's why uh, we, we have that expression, smother crops. Uh, here is a, a study I did in Kentucky. Uh, back when I was in Kentucky, we planted a thick uh, crop of uh, oats. We pushed it when it started forming seed. We pushed it down. We didn't spray it. We just pushed it down with a big wheel uh, to crink it, and it died. And then we uh, transplanted squash in it. And you see uh, beautiful, very few weeds, one, two, three, uh, nothing. And at this stage, when the plants are starting to be harvested, these weeds are insignificant in terms of economic uh, effect on the yield. A great approach, uh, the, this thick layer of oats uh, acted as a smother crop. Of course, uh, another benefit is that the squash, uh, pumpkin, or watermelon, uh, any of those crops, the fruit will sit on that and not sit on soil and, and potentially rot. That's another advantage of that. And um, this approach does not have to be done on large scale. Here it is done on one single row. This is a wheat uh, crop that, uh, or rye, I'm not sure, uh, that was planted in a row. And this row here, this organic grower in, uh, in uh, Austin area, will cut this and then plant in it uh, whatever, uh, whatever crop he wants. He's getting, he's getting fertilizer uh, from the clippings is getting excellent weed control. You see, you don't see any weeds here. It's only a solid cover of grasses, and um, um, and that's it. So excellent benefit. Uh, so it can be done on a on a single row on a raised bed. Uh, like I told, does not have to apply only if you're a commercial producer and you know, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Competitive crops, um, yeah. That can work in theory if you have a crop that works, that grows tall and fast aggressively and will outshade uh, the weeds. Okra is an example. Uh, beans, uh, if you travel some, um, 
but the idea here is that the crop, in this case wheat in Canada, this is very popular up north, the wheat grows tall, it's over the weeds, not going to be shaded by the wheat, and when they harvest the top area, um, uh, you know, they don't have to worry about the weeds when they germinate later. Of course, they do apply uh, herbicides to control the weeds early in the season, but whatever those uh, that germinate later, uh, the wheat crop is above it, uh, it's not going to affect it. And that's what we call competitive crop. Those crops that are aggressive, they grow taller than the weeds. Crop rotation is something you want to consider. Um, because uh, each crop has its own uh, activity and that activity will affect the weeds uh, that will uh, grow there. Anyway, crop rotation has many, many benefits, not just in weed control. Uh, briefly, when you rotate, when you follow crop rotation, you're not uh, rotating between names of the crops. You are rotating, and let me use the pointer, uh, you're not rotating between names of the crop, you are rotating between families of the crops, okay? Uh, I'm sorry it's messy here, but uh, um, ho ho more than 90% of the vegetables we grow fits into nine families which are here. So with time, with practice, with experience, you will learn that tomato, eggplant, pepper, potato are in the same family. So you don't want to plant tomato and then follow it by pepper. That's not a rotation because they are in the same family. You will learn that onion, garlic, chives, shallots are all in the same family. You'll learn that peas and beans are all in the same family. Uh, you will learn that all the vine crops, cucumber, melon, pumpkin, zucchini, all those are in the same family. Those are obvious. You know, but there are some things that uh, are always even a surprise to me. Like, uh, who would think that uh, uh, cilantro? Uh, sorry, uh, where is it? Uh, I'm always fascinated by radish being in the same family as cauliflower and cabbage. I mean, I know that now, but who would think that radish is in the same family as the cold crops, cabbage, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, etc. So. Bottom line, you want to switch between uh, families, not between the names within a family. So, um, and here's an example of a good rotation and a bad rotation. And a bad rotation doesn't mean instant death and you'll have a total loss because of disease or weed. It just means you are increasing your risk uh, with time. Uh, it's plain odds. You're increasing the risk of, of if something bad is going to happen, it's going to happen, and it's going to happen uh, seriously. Let me describe the good rotation. In year one, you plant tomato followed by spinach. Year two, bean followed by mustard. Year three, cantaloupe followed by onion. In year four, when you start the cycle again, between tomato and tomato, you have five crops and two and a half years. So whatever weed, whatever insect, whatever disease that favors tomato, you starved it for two and a half years and uh, put in uh, five crops that may not be uh, their favorite crop to feed on, okay? In the bad rotation, tomato followed by potato, that's the same family. So it's as if you planted the whole year tomato. Year two, you switched, but bean and peas are the same family. Year three, cantaloupe, pumpkin, those are the same family. So between year, when you start the cycle again in year four, between tomato and tomato, you had two crops instead of five crops, and you had two years instead of two and a half years. And that's what I mean by you're increasing the odds of something happening, bad happening, uh, not instant death. So remember, switch between families, not between names. And this slide here, study it slowly. It is uh, my idea of uh, four bed rotation or four year rotation. If you have four beds, you can f follow this, uh, or you have or one bed in, in four years, you can follow that. 
um, what I have next to each name is their uh, is the planting and harvest date. So, for example, potato from two one to five one, followed by snap beans, uh, followed by buckwheat, which is a cover crop, followed by garlic uh, from eight fifteen to the following year. Uh, uh, you know, 515 harvested then, then you plant buckwheat, then another cover crop, then cabbage. Cabbage carries over to the following year, followed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. When you look at this, you'll see that there's nothing idle. There's no idle time. I mentioned that to you that it's it's never have an idle time uh, where the soil is just sitting there. It's like it's. Uh, Insects are laying eggs in it, uh, weeds are dropping from the birds or the sky, uh, diseases are multiplying. Always have crop, cover crop, or solarize. You see here on the bottom right corner, you have an option of solarizing in uh, between tomato and a cold crop. If you want to use that solarization, or if you don't want, you can plant a grain like a wheat, something that can tolerate uh, the cold season towards the end of the summer. Okay, so study this carefully. The dates may uh, differ, you know, like you may harvest uh, uh, snap beans earlier, you may harvest it later, depending on where you are, but it gives you an idea that, hey, uh, um, crop cover crop, crop cover crop, that's one benefit. The other benefit is any crop following the other is, is a different family. Um, so that's another benefit. Beautiful example of rotation and, and adjusted to your liking, to your needs. Allelopathy is the uh, third option in in um, in weed control. Excuse me. Um, this is the allelopathy means uh, the plant itself, whether alive or dead, uh, releases chemicals uh, that kill germinating seeds. Uh, for example, we know that uh, ryegrass um, uh, kills uh, when it's alive, releases chemicals and uh, reduce weeds. That's why uh, you know we don't uh, uh, lots of growers use it as a cover crop. Uh, when it's dead, uh, you uh, cold crops like cabbage, cauliflower. If you, if you chop the crop at the end of the season and uh, let it rot in the soil, that will kill your seeds too. You all know that pine needles uh, makes the soil acidic, and that's what, uh, uh, and that's an example of allelopathy, the acidity from the pine needles. Uh, that's why you don't see weeds germinating under a pine tree, because of the acidic uh, uh, content created by the deteriorating pine needles. So that's the bottom line of allelopathy, and you can use it to your example. Beneficial animals, this is becoming more and more popular uh, with uh, organic growers. And here's a link. You can look at this uh, uh, organic farm, Legier Ranch, where they use ducks and geese and other stuff to, to eat the weeds, uh, and especially wheat seeds. And they're not, and of course, their uh, vegetable crop is, uh, is, uh, has, a, has a fence around it like a chicken wire, uh, so uh, they don't nibble on, on those vegetables. Uh, uh, okay. Let's switch to organic uh, herbicides, um, and that fits into the chemical option, chemical control option. Um, um, corn, gluten, meal, so far is the only a pre-emergence herbicide available. And by pre-emergence mean you apply it when there are no weeds there. So before they, em they emerge, that's when it, this herbicide is effective. Now, how do you use corn gluten meal will affect its, will affect its uh, uh, benefit. If you, uh, if you apply it, if you apply it today, mix it in the soil and you plant it tomorrow, you did not add an herbicide, you added a fertilizer. It's uh, because it has 910 uh, uh, NPK content, 9% uh, nitrogen content. That's like a fertilizer, better than a lot of organic fertilizer. 
Um, so you may see a flush of weeks when you add water and you add that. Uh, to get the benefit of corn gluten meal as an herbicide, you have to have a clean uh, ground, rototilled, clean, no weeds. You add it, you mix it, you uh, add water, and to, uh, you, you, you let it rot and break down for two weeks to, to release the chemicals in it that will kill uh, the, uh, the weeds. And then a week or two weeks later, whatever, then you can plant. So keep that in mind. And, uh, and again, the definition of pre-emergence means it does not kill weeds that are already germinated. It will only kill weeds that uh, are, have not germinated yet. As they germinate, uh, they get killed by the corn gluten meal. There is, and I don't have that slide here, but there is an, an herbicide available. Um, I don't know if you are interested in buying it. It is organic, uh, and I will write the name in the chat box. It's called uh, Axe. AXXE. Uh, I mean, I, uh, you can buy it, but uh, you cannot buy uh, like two ounces or three ounces. Uh, that's why, uh, it's, you know, I don't know if you can willing to buy uh, a quart or a gallon jug. Uh, unfortunately, it's not available in smaller amounts for homeowners, maybe in the future. But Axe herbicide is a post-emergent herbicide. Think of Roundup. You see the weeds, you spray them, you kill them. Uh, Axe acts that way, but it's an uh, organic uh, option. Uh, it kills the weed and burns them, and it works that way. So those are the only two good uh, herbicides I can think of. Uh, the other option is uh, barriers. And we talked about cardboard, uh, newspapers, uh, garden fabric, uh, all anything like as a cover, as a mulch, uh, acts as a weed barrier. Uh, acts. There are lots of other herbicides, but uh, like uh, here, uh, I mentioned Axe. Uh, I've, I've tested it, it works well. Uh, uh, organic commercial producers are use it. There are lots of options that you see here, Avenger, Green Match, Weed Zap, 20% vinegar, Burnout, and they contain uh, natural products like citrus oil, clove oil, cinnamon oil, etc. cetera. Uh, they, they can, uh, I've heard mixed uh, reviews on them. Uh, and the reason they are not always effective is timing. You wait till that weed is four or six inches tall it, uh, and it's 90 degree temperature outside, you may not kill it. You say, oh, the uh, vinegar is a waste of money. No, it wasn't a waste of money. You should have applied it a month earlier. So timing, proper application uh, can make a difference between good, good, good burn down or uh, zero control. But these, here they are, their option. Uh, I know vinegar is available. I don't know if these, how many of the rest are available at uh, box stores like uh, uh, Lowe's or Home Depot. Mechanical weed control is still number one. Um, I, uh, my favorite, what happened here? My favorite is this here uh, because it's light. Uh, uh, you can weed forward and backward as you, it's sharp as when you put it on the soil surface and you move forward and backward, you're shaving the top half inch of quarter inch of that soil surface and you do it early enough when the weeds are one inch tall, uh, you can weed all day and not even uh, break a sweat. And that is the idea. And remember, it's a year long activity because after it seems like after every rainfall, you'll have a new flush of weeds. So unfortunately, when I was in Michigan, weed control was early in the season and then you can forget it. Uh, not, not here. After every heavy rain, uh, decent rain, whatever, it's warm. We have a ton of weeds, uh, good soil moisture, or good conditions. You always have weeds. So keep that handy. Keep your hose uh, uh, sharp and clean and make a habit of uh, getting them as early as possible. And uh, yeah, you, will, uh, you will have excellent weed control. 
This is the uh, flamer uh, that can be used uh, by a homeowner. As you see, it's a propane tank and as a backpack. It gives you uh, 400,000 BTU. It's a great... Uh, now, remember, you don't put the flame on the weed until it's uh, burned to a crisp. You just pass over it and a quick uh, uh, scorching will kill them. I found that uh, broad leaves uh, are easier to kill than grasses. Uh, somehow grasses are genetically adapted to hot, hotter climate. Uh, so, but if you get them early, remember one inch or smaller, you can get rid of them uh, easy and uh, uh, fast and effectively. So timing and timing and timing, like I mentioned, is very important in weed control. There are uh, tools available for big, uh, heavy, deep-rooted perennials. Not heavy, uh, I'm sorry, deep perennial weeds. For example, this uh, grandpa's weeder has long spikes and a foot rest so that you can use your foot to push and act like a lever to dig up uh, heavy, deep-rooted weeds. I'm sorry, by heavy means, I mean, uh, you know, I don't know, difficult. I don't know why I keep using heavy. Um, deep rooted perennials like dandelions, you know, things like that. It, it does work. Yeah. You want to get uh, rid as much of the root underground to uh, get rid of that weed, otherwise, it'll keep coming back. Don't forget mulching. And on the pictures you see here, there are lots of options. Some are uh, some are uh, plastic, and nowadays you have biodegradable plastic. It uh, breaks down within a year. It, fall, it breaks down to smaller pieces, so you don't have to worry about removing or disposal of that plastic. Uh, the second one, the circle, that's made out of uh, cocoa, not uh, cocoa fiber. Uh, so that where again works, and with time it breaks down. So it's like adding uh, mulch initially, and then compost later. So here are your options between peat and mulch and uh, bricks and cocoa fiber weed mat, etc. Um, if you are not against um, uh, or chemical herbicides. There are rollers available like the one you see here, or you can build your own from, a, from PVC and a, a paint roller. And this way you are brushing the tall weeds with Roundup. You're not spraying it. Roundup is systemic. It means it moves in the plant, and you, so you don't have to spray the whole plant to kill it. So you brush a few leaves and it moves in and kills it all without having to spray and risk uh, contaminating the soil or spraying your crop. So rollers, uh, you can buy them or you can build your own, uh, are a great option if you're not against uh, products like uh, Roundup. So remember, the success of any uh, pesticide, uh, the benefit of any pesticide you use, whether uh, whether fungicide, insecticide, or herbicide for weed control, uh, the success is determined by uh, you read the label and you follow the instructions and you use uh, well calibrated equipment. Okay? And of course, the appropriate herbicide. Read the label because not all herbicides kill all weeds. If the weed is not on that label, uh, means uh, it may not control it. Use it at your own risk. You may be wasting your money. Uh, so read the label. It's the law. Uh, it tells you about how safe it is, how you apply it to reduce risk to your health, whether organic or inorganic. You have to read the label because to me, unless you are spraying water, anything can be toxic to your body. Just because it's an organic herbicide doesn't mean it's safe, and I challenge anybody to contradict me. Uh, take an organic herbicide and spray it in your eyes and tell me if it's safe. Follow the label. <laughs> That's a joke. Follow the label, read it, uh, uh, not just how to apply it, uh, what weeds it controls, but read the instructions uh, related to your safety as the app. Okay. Um, 
it's again more uh, keys to success and chemical control in addition to good equipment and reading the label you want a, a, a soil that uh, free of clods free of plant residue because you want to spray the soil you don't want to spray the lumps of clay clods because then uh, you know you're wasting your money good moisture you don't want to spray a soil that's born dry you want that moisture to to hold on to that herbicide and, and activate it and make it work. Good uniform coverage and some herbicides they tell you needs to be incorporated, like mixed in the soil, whether with water or with a mechanical incorporation, so it can be effective, not just spray on the surface uh, and uh, move on. So this for me is what I call a good soil ready uh, for being sprayed with an herbicide. Anything different than this, uh, clean it, make it look nice, then whatever you're spraying, organic or inorganic. Of course, with, uh, inorga with organic herbicides, most of them available, like I told you, are post-emergence, so it will not be used in this situation unless you're using corn gluten meal. So if this was my organic operation and my field looked like this, I will spread the corn gluten meal, I will add water, I will mix it in, uh, and then wait two weeks and then plant. Otherwise, uh, if I'm not using corn gluten meal, I'll wait for weeds to germinate and then uh, and then spray them with any of those organic options, like I told you, whether it's wheat zap or vinegar or axe, uh, all those products I listed. Uh, let me skip a few. In summary, the most effective mean of controlling weed is a system approach, like I mentioned, rely Oh, and here's a good example. Let's go back to that picture uh, I showed you earlier. Uh, this here is cultivated. That's an example of mechanical uh, approach. Uh, the mulch, an example of a cultural approach and herbicides that you apply here to kill the weed escapes or those that were not cultivated is an example of chemical control. So a combination of the three uh, is needed to have, uh, I mean, here they were successful with the mechanical, they were successful with the cultural, but the edge of the plastic that they could not uh, uh, cultivate uh, to avoid uh, ripping out the plastic mulch, uh, that uh, is a weakness and that failed in this situation. Well, that's where they have to either hold it by hand or use a uh, herbicide to control it. So a system approach is your answer. With that, I uh, end and I uh, open uh, to questions. <laughs>